My name is Dennis Mitchell, and I'm the Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement at Columbia University. Um, I am honored to welcome you to It's Complicated, Latino Voters in the 2020 Elections. Uh, we expect to be an exciting conversation on the role and impact of Latinos in the last electoral cycle and in the future of politics in America. This event is a follow-up to an event we hosted almost exactly four years ago in the aftermath of the 2016 election, and it was entitled, What Happened to the Latino Vote? Like then, today we've brought together a panel of leaders from academia, journalism, and politics, led by Columbia University Professor of English, Francis Negron Moutinier. Professor Moutinier is one of the world's leading scholars of Latino studies, groundbreaking artist, and professor at Columbia University. Her scholarship and artistry span a wide range of forms, such as film, public art, and essay, with a focus on the Caribbean, the African diaspora, and Latinos in the United States. A link to her extensive and impressive biography, as well as those of our other speakers, can be found in the chat. I'm grateful for her leadership and vision. Welcome our other speakers. And with that, I'll turn it over to Francis. Thanks so much. So I, I wanted to start by thanking uh, everyone who made today possible, uh, especially uh, the wonderful Adina Berfield Brooks, Assistant Provost for Faculty Advancement at Columbia, and co-architect, I would say, of both the 2016 and the 2020 event. And of course, the equally wonderful Dennis Mitchell, Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, and our panelists. Um, in our 2016 event, which was titled, What Really Happened, I think, Latinos and the 2016 election, we analyze election dynamics from Latino perspectives, not only to get a clear picture of what happened, but also to consider future practices as these things are not merely objects of study for us. Uh, two of the questions that dominated the debate at the time were one, given the critical and enormous role that anti-Latino immigrant rhetoric played in Trump's campaign, why did, didn't more Latinos turn out to vote? And why did so many Latinos, relatively speaking, supported the Trump campaign? In 2016, I also like us to remind us, I like to remind us that the jur journalist's favorite word to describe the Latino electorate was still the sleeping giant. In 2020, the sleeping giant trope seems to have been put to sleep or at least suspended. And now there's a new one. And I only mention this word once because I, I, I have problems with it. Latinos are now, as we said, to be best described as not a monolith. <laughs> that is not uniform and unmovable. In fact, they are complicated. I guess it's something of a step forward to go from asleep to complicated. Um, but as poll data became available, the notion of complicated seemed to mean that despite more Latinos voting Democrat than in the prior election, a higher number were also planning to vote Republican. The idea that Latinos are complicated also, you could say, reached new heights when the press began to more extensively cover the fact that the chairman of the far right white supremacist organization, among other descriptors we can use, known as the Proud Boys, is a self-described Afro-Cuban man named Enrique Tarrio. And that one of the leaders in the quest to undermine the certification of Biden's win in the US Senate was another Cuban, Ted Cruz. In other words, from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez through Miguel Cardona and even Kimberly Guilfoyle to name a few, Latinos in the mainstream political stage may appear very complicated indeed. Now, complicated means difficult to analyze, understand, or explain. However, perhaps Latinos appear more complicated than other groups because frameworks and concepts are simplified and there's not enough debate about it. In any event, we use the hook to get us all together to discuss further. And to start, I'd like to share a few questions that have been on our mind as we uh, organize this event and before turning the mic, so to speak, to the panelists. So question one, why? Have Latinos gone from sleeping giant to complicated? Well, to form a hypothesis, one possibility, Latinos surged at the polls and were fundamental in getting Biden and Harris elected. So the giant or giantess awoke and already had coffee, you could say. 
but less obvious is why the sleeping giant is now complicated. Another hypothesis. When used by many journalists, it seems the moniker is an attempt to grasp not the complexity of the United States or Latinos, but to mark that Latinos are not behaving as desire expected. In this way, the sleeping giant and complicated bear a certain resemblance as tropes. Latinos are dubbed complicated because as racialized populations in the US, they should reject conservative white supremacists and other discourses and political organizations organized around those foundations. But while most Latinos do, a persistent quarter or third depends on who you talk to and in the context and circumstances, either embraces or ignores white supremacy and other far right discourses and supports conservative candidates. Now, an alternative paradigm to the complicated, to the notion of complicated might be complexity. That is, what happens when we examine the workings of racism and racial formations in the US and Latin America? Uh, the specific ways that Latinos become collectively racialized, but racialization is signified and acted upon very different across the United States. What happens when we take into consideration the relationship between the U.S. and the countries of origins of immigrants and the case of Puerto Rican colonial migrants, as well as we take into account where they reside, their class and education, gender, age, sexuality, and so forth. Number two, I would say, what does love have to do with it? That is, what did organizing have to do with the quantity and quality of Latino electoral participation? In 2016, in our panel, we heard people who worked for the Democratic Party talk about how the party did not put sufficient resources or effort into the campaign to elect Hillary Clinton, and that many Latinos felt that the party didn't represent them in general. In 2020, Mainstream political organizations appear to invest more resources in registering and mobilizing Latino voters, and Latino groups such as Mi Gente, led by Marisa Franco and other groups, made robust efforts to organize Latino voters, including phone calls, knocks on doors, texts, you name it, in Arizona, in Georgia, in Pennsylvania, among other places. The results were pretty impressive. Many more Latinos came out to vote, and their vote counted heavily as many key contexts in the race for the Electoral College were close. As Julio Varela recently observed in relation to a study released this week by the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative, 16.6 .6 million Latinos voted, which is a 30.9 increase from 2016. And I'll let Julio talk some more about that later, but that's definitely a, uh, a difference between 2020 and 2016. Number three, what and how did media matter? In both 26, 2016 and 2020, media matters were a central focus. Fake news, Russian hackers, Facebook algorithms, liberal bias, Bernie blackout, all were subjects of intense debate in an effort to understand the impact of all old and new technologies in polarizing voters, siloing communities, and spreading misinformation. Not generally included in this analysis, however, is the role of Latino media ecosystems, in the words of John Ellis, uh, as well as micro-targeting of populations that have resulted, and maybe you will talk some more about this, the hyper-localizing uh, media messaging that is working maybe in known and unknown ways. We might have questions about how this is actually working. Number four, I'd like to bring up, did we just get another masterclass from Puerto Rico? That was a, a, a term used to describe the mass mobilizations in the summer of 2019 uh, as a masterclass to the world about how to uh, eject an executive from office. Now, most of the time, Puerto Rico, which is legally a US territory where citizens, however, cannot vote in US elections, is generally mentioned in three kinds of ways in US electoral cycles. During the primaries, where voters can actually vote on the island, when a pro-statehood candidate wins the governorship, because that makes people very scared, or, or some people very scared over here. And when there's a, an election coincides with a plebiscite vote, which 22 uh, did. At the same time, there were differences with 22. While perhaps not the revolution some people wanted or expected, the 2020 election process there in Puerto Rico was remarkable in multiple ways. And its inclusion in this context is not an attempt to say that politics there are the same as politics here, but rather to call attention to the possibilities that voters there opened up 
and to provide spaces for uh, connection between like-minded movement throughout, let's say, the Puerto Rican Latino diaspora. Among the many shifts that occurred, I will mention two. One, the increase in support for Movimiento Victoria Ciudadana, a party officially founded in 2019 on an anti-colonial but a post-status platform offering to tackle the country's critical problems, including corruption, debt crisis, gender violence. The increase was registered in various ways, including that the gubernatorial candidate, Alexandra Lugaro, received 14.2% of the vote. And the still possible election of candidate Manuel Natal here with us today as the mayor of the biggest city, San Juan. Victoria Ciudadana also elected progressives like Rafael Bernabe, and Anaima Rivera Lacen, who also became the first openly lesbian and black feminist legislator in the Senate. There was also a shift in voting behavior for those uh, um, voting for status oriented parties. So while 52% still voted for statehood in the consultation, less than 32% voted for the pro statehood candidate. And the pro independence party candidate likewise received 13.7% of the vote in a country where the independence option has not received more than 5% of the vote since 1967. Lastly, when we organized or thought about this event uh, right after the, well, a little before the elections, but around that period, um, much has happened since then. It's amazing, but a lot of things have happened since then. Uh, but just yesterday, Biden and Harris were sworn in finally, and a growing list of appointees already at their post, which begs the question of what to expect and how to best collaborate going forward. So to engage with these questions, I'm accompanied by four distinguished and exciting panelists, at least for me. Uh, before inviting uh, all panelists to offer a few uh, minutes of uh, remarks, let me just briefly introduce them. So Jamil Velez is assistant professor of political science at Columbia. His research and teaching interests lie at the intersection between racial and ethnic politics, political psychology, and political geography with a focus on immigration. Uh, Marisa Franco is a Phoenix-based organizer, writer, and strategist. She's the director and co-founder of Mi Gente, a hub for Latinx and Chicanx organizing and movement building. In her over 10 years of work, Marisa has helped lead key campaigns rooted in low-income and communities of color, characterized by their innovation and effectiveness. Manuel Natal is a Puerto Rican attorney and a member of Puerto Rico's House of Representatives since 2013. During 2016's general election, Manuel was re-elected um, as represented a large of the popular Democratic Party with the largest amount of vote, votes. Two years later, Manuel became an independent member of Puerto Rico's House of Representatives after leaving popu the popular Democratic Party due to differences of principle and values with the leadership. Representative Natal is currently part of a new political movement that seeks to end corruption, overturn austerity, and move beyond historic stalemates. And in 2020, as I mentioned, he ran for the mayor of San Juan. I think there was a development today. Uh, on something. Um, Julio Ricardo Varela is the founder, publisher of Latino Rebels and co-host of In the Thick podcast. So I would like to turn it over to Julio. Uh, give us some idea what's happening. Oh, first of all, thank you for um, the opportunity. I think what we're seeing, and I can speak at it from like a political journalist perspective more than anything. But I think what we're seeing is sort of an intense battle of, of two narratives. One that is incredibly mainstream and a little bit simplistic, that is still grounded in, in what people think the Latino community is in 2020. One that's grounded in a history based on um, Cold, War, Cold War politics, uh, migration, um, media markets in Miami, um, the list can go on and on. And I think when we tend to forget when the election results were coming in that night that everyone seemed to focus on Miami-Dade as the only place where anyone of Latino descent comes from. And it was a disservice, I think. I think political journalists who are my colleagues uh, really dropped the ball on that. Because one of the things that was missed, if you were actually covering the election, and I, I did cover the election from a lot from a Latinx space. Um, I did make, you know, I wasn't 
on the ground as much as a lot of fantastic Latina and Latino journalists are from, you know, I can think of Jasmine Ulloa from the Boston Globe. Um, I think of Jennifer Medina from New York Times. Uh, people that were really looking at this through a lens every day on the ground. We all kind of knew that there was sort of an enthusiasm for uh, Donald Trump, but we also weren't surprised. And I think there was this shock on on election night that like, how can Donald Trump win Miami Dade? It's because he invested in the community and it was part of the campaign strategy. Actual dollars were put into uh, Miami-Dade after 2016. The same case could be made um, in the early parts of the primary, which I, which I covered regarding Bernie Sanders. One of the biggest lessons that the Bernie Sanders campaign made after 2016 is that they were getting, they were tracking very well with younger Latinos and Latinas and saw it as an opportunity to invest in certain places. People tend to forget that, for example, Clark County in 2016, um, Hillary Clinton defeated Bernie Sanders in that primary. That, he flipped it. Uh, Bernie Sanders actually won a lot of um, urban Southwest uh, precincts. And there was this you know, notion of Theo Bernie, which kind of led the challenge of where was the Joe Biden campaign, which was an issue. So what, what really comes down from this is sort of that was never really discussed. You know, there was this surprise that Arizona all of a sudden was engaged when anyone that has been covering Arizona for the last 10 years would tell you that grassroots activism started the moment SB 1070, anti-immigration law, was a reality. And that's 10 years of organizing. Same thing in Georgia, you know, mentioned Mi Gente and Marisa. Um, that was built on a, a multiracial, multi-ethnic coalition with the realization that the New South was becoming more Latino and Latin American, was changing in front of our faces. Um, this didn't happen overnight. You know, states like Georgia, even a state like North Carolina, which had an opportunity. So. What the bigger takeaway is, is that what you're seeing, and to go back to the point about the two narratives, what you're seeing is a mostly white male political science data coverage, you know, the 538s of the world, the upshots of the world, who are still trying to come to terms with this notion that the Latino community is going to vote in a block. And Anyone who's grown up in any situation, in any community, whether you're Puerto Rican, Mexican, Cuban descent, Dominican, Central American, growing up in this country or coming from another country would tell you that just never was a reality. But what was interesting, and, and this is the other missed story, was the pandemic. Because the turnout and there's a record turnout and, and, and the good folks at UCLA, and I encourage people to look at this report, um, LPPI, UCLA, UCLA Latino. Um, we also, I also wrote a story for Latino Rebels. The pandemic played a part in this, not just Donald Trump. And to say that you've increased the Latino vote, the estimate of a 30.9% 30, 30 increase over an election cycle, where you have 16.6 .6 million voters, um, and they help turn states around. You know, there's an argument to be made that Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia as part of that multiracial coalition, Nevada, um, those all went to Joe Biden because of Latinos coming out, grassroots work, not necessarily money coming in. I think. My, my last two final points is here. You mentioned the sleeping giant, Francis, and I need to quote my, my good friend, Marcella Garcia of the Boston Globe, who I just recorded with earlier today, who basically says it is a trope. 
And Marcella makes a point about the sleeping giant saying it puts the onus on the community to wake up. Someone has to wake us up when in fact we've already been awake and we need to wake you up. And what you're seeing, and it's really exciting, what you're seeing is sort of this beginning of what I like to think of as real political power. That now what everyone has been predicting is starting to happen. But you wouldn't know it if you read Upshot or 538. You wouldn't know it because everyone has an obsession with Miami and Southern Texas because they couldn't believe that Latinos would vote for Donald Trump, where everyone I would know whether, you know, we can get into the conversations of race and class and culture and gender and Latin Americanness and colonialism and all all the all the factors that make us all as complicated as we are, um, there is no surprise. There's a reason why I predicted that the exit polls would be what they were. I missed it by a point. So I think it it it, it comes down to issues of representation in media access, being able to have voices tell the stories of the community. It's happening slowly. But I think it's also very important to, to know that it's also seen as a threat. And I think that's where politics and political power begin to challenge the status quo. And we're just starting to see that, I believe, on a national level in, in the United States. So, yeah, I definitely want to come back to a lot of the things you said. But uh, let's go to Jamil and then we'll pick that up later in the conversation. Yeah, so I, I think it's really useful to think about uh, the two narratives and also kind of explore the, I think, uh, the difference between what seemed to be kind of the snap judgments that people were making on election night, which very much seemed to fall into this uh, thinking of Latinos as kind of voting generally, you know, in, in a monolithic fashion, with the exception of the Cuban Americans, kind of, you know, placing an asterisk on Cuban American participation and, and partisanship. Um, and, and kind of thinking about the difference between what we saw on election night and, and what ended up kind of unfolding as we as people started digging into what was happening at a neighborhood level, not only in places like South Florida, but also Osceola County, Orange County in Florida, um, you know, uh, Julio re referred to the, you know, uh, Southern Texas, but also if we, if we go to, um, uh, you know, uh, Central Massachusetts, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this kind of interesting finding that despite, uh, you know, observing different baselines of support, right, because we know that Cuban Americans traditionally are more likely to support uh, Republican candidates, uh, uh, Latino, uh, as Latinos of other kind of national origin uh, groups uh, tend to uh, vote more democratic. The interesting thing was, despite kind of the different baselines, we did see a very similar kind of shift, a uh, rightward shift uh, across uh, a variety of states um, and, and, and people who have kind of looked at, uh, you know, immigrant dense uh, neighborhoods have observed similar shifts uh, at the precinct level. Um, and I think one of the uh, what, what I at least appreciate in terms of some of the post-election coverage is to acknowledge this complexity as opposed to, as, as Julio referred to it, as, as you know, having these, uh, for the most part, kind of data journalists uh, expressing shock, um, having them come to grips with the fact that you're dealing with a heterogeneous population, not one that you can kind of, uh, you know, treat in, 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 as, as it, to some, some degree being uh, in the, uh, kind of uh, strongly attached to the Democratic Party. Um, and so uh, for me, I think one of the, the um, most fascinating kind of aspects of the 2020 election, which, which I think, uh, I, I imagine a lot of political scientists, but just political analysts in general are going to try to explore is kind of breaking, up, breaking apart what, what explains those shifts. So why was, was there a rightward shift? Was it, you know, so some of the hypotheses include that, uh, you know, Trump was already uh, his baseline of support was very low. So there was only up, you know, you could only go up from there. Um, you know, other explanations kind of dealt with the gendered nature of, of uh, uh, you know, of, uh, of Trump and the way he, pre he presents himself. Uh, uh, there are a lot of, I think, a lot, uh, many explanations that might, uh, you know, come to mind when we try to think about these rightward shifts. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things, at least about thinking in terms of thinking about Latino politics is uh, to, to acknowledge that there are complexity, uh, uh, not only is the community complex, but the explanations for their political behavior is complex. Um, and we really need to grapple with that, at least uh, speaking as a political scientist. 
All right, thank you, Jamil. Um, uh, I think Marisa is not on the line yet. So uh, Manuel, do you wanna tell us a bit about what's going on or what has been going on and seem, seem uh, still going on in Puerto Rico in terms of 2020? Perfect. Well, buenas tardes. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. And I, I think when we talk about electoral politics in Puerto Rico, then it's it's complicated. It's really, really complicated. And and when we analyze electoral politics in Puerto Rico, I think we can look into two layers. First, uh, Puerto Rican politics and then U.S. politics. As some of you may know, Puerto Rican political parties have traditionally been organized around the status issue. Uh, that is the political relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. And we have traditionally had three political parties here in Puerto Rico, one pro-statehood, one pro-commonwealth, one pro-independence. And that, ha as, as Professor Negron explained, it's, it's uh, one of the things that Victoria Ciudadana is trying to change is the way we organize politically and, and not to organize only around the status question, but, but also around uh, the country that we want to live in uh, today, tomorrow, and, and the day after we we resolve once and for all our colonial uh, our colonial relationship, and and it's interesting because uh, those two layers coexist in Puerto Rico because the second layer is U.S. politics and particularly uh, between the two main political parties that have been uh, traditionally the ones that have participated actively in U.S. politics. Uh, that is the statehood party and the commonwealth party. And you have people within both parties that identify in U.S. politics both with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, right now, uh, our resident commissioner in Washington, Jennifer Gonzalez, she's a member of the statehood party in Puerto Rico, uh, but she's also uh, a member of the Republican Party in the United States and in Puerto Rico. Our current governor, Pedro Pierluisi, he's a member of the statehood party in Puerto Rico, but he's a member of the Democratic Party in the United States. And I think that's that element is obviously imp important to consider, particularly when we talk about Puerto Ricans that have uh, moved uh, to the United States and whether they participate or not on U.S. politics, one, and what's their affiliation once they um, participate in, in U.S. politics. But... So, that, so that's the first thing. In Puerto Rico, it's, it's politics. It's, it's really, really complicated, uh, at least electoral politics. The second thing is that uh, the 2020 elections, uh, without a doubt, were historical elections in Puerto Rico, both, be, both because of the results, but also, unfortunately, due to all the irregularities that happened uh, during the election, before the election, and after the election. Irregularities that today... Uh, on the third uh, week of, of January, we're still uh, trying to, to search for answers uh, here in Puerto Rico. Uh, in terms of the historic results of, of these elections, this was the first uh, general election. And in Puerto Rico, it's important to point out that we have elections every four years. And that November, we go out and vote for everything. We vote for the governor. We vote for our legislative assembly, we vote for our municipalities, we vote everything every four years. And so, so this was the first election in Puerto Rico since Hurricane Maria. This was the first election since the summer of 2019 in Puerto Rico. So there was a lot of expe expectation uh, with this uh, general election in Puerto Rico, uh, because obviously we, uh, the the people that were going out to vote on the 3rd of November of 2020 were very different from that that went out to vote in 2016. So there was a lot of expectation in terms of change. Uh, we had a new political movement in Victoria Ciudadana. Uh, we had uh, the two-party system in Puerto Rico that had suffered a lot, uh, including in the 2016 election, in which we had the first uh, independent candidates for governor in Puerto Rico. And between those two candidates, they managed to receive close to 17, 18 percent in the in the last general election. So, so there was a lot of expectations to this election. The results, in in my uh, at least from 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 my point of view, I I think we definitely succeeded in in many areas. In some, uh, we didn't move the needle as far as as we expected, but 
the two-party system here uh, in terms of the people that went out to vote for the governor position, close to 40% of the voters that actually went out to vote decided for, to vote for options outside of the two-party system. And, and those results are, are historic in itself. Uh, the current governor of Puerto Rico was elected with close to 32%. Less than, than half a million people voted uh, for this governor. To give you a little bit of perspective, uh, Luis Fortuño, who was governor uh, elected by the statehood party, a Republican, who was elected in 2008, so just 12 years before, he was elected with more than a million votes. And fast forward 12 years later, and his uh, then uh, 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 party uh, ticket uh, companion, Pedro Pierluisi, who back then was resident commissioner, he managed to get close to a little bit over 400,000 votes. So, so I think the two-party system was definitely uh, uh, affected uh, by this election. And then we were able to elect, particularly in the, leg in the legislative assembly, a very, very diverse uh, group of individuals, both from Victoria Ciudadana, from the Independence Party, and then from a more uh, conservative uh, right-wing party uh, that was also created towards this uh, general election in 2020. Uh, I think something interesting to interesting to point out and, and, and kind of to uh, engage, I guess, the relationship with the U.S. politics. In these elections in Puerto Rico, we uh, had close to less than the less than 300,000 vote in comparison to the last general election. So that represents close to a 8% decrease in participation. Um, we still don't, don't necessarily have all the answers in terms of where those people went, whether they just decided to not participate on the general election, or if those individuals left the island uh, as a result of the economic and fiscal crisis that Puerto Rico has been going through, particularly as a result of the hurricanes, the earthquakes, and, and whatnot. But I think that's also going to be reflected in U.S. politics and the participation of, of Puerto Rican diaspora in, in the United States. And, and, and when we get through the process of, of what the Electoral Commission here does to kind of uh, clean our, our electoral registry, we're going to be able to tell how many of these individuals that didn't vote it. They didn't vote it because they have registered to vote outside of Puerto Rico. Uh, particularly, obviously, in the United States. And, and I think, and, and with this, I'll, I'll, I'll round up my initial intervention. And I think that's something particularly different with this election. I, I got a sense, particularly from my friends uh, that for different reasons uh, have been living in the U.S., uh, whether it's since this economic crisis started in 2006 or a little bit earlier. I, I think this was the first election in which I got a sense that they were actually committed to participating in the electoral process in the United States. And, and that, I, I think, has a lot to do with the fact that particularly Puerto Ricans that have uh, left Puerto Rico in the last couple of years due to the economic crisis, the, the hurricane and whatnot, have done so thinking that they're going to come back to Puerto Rico. And since they have one foot in Puerto Rico and one foot in Florida or one foot in New York or whatever it is, uh, some of them don't even register to vote in those places because they want to continue to have the opportunity to participate in, in Puerto Rican politics. And I think in, in this election, I, I got a sense from, from a lot of friends in, in the Puerto Rican diaspora that they felt that it was important to help Puerto Rico by participating in U.S. politics and making sure that Puerto Rico was an important item in any presidential candidate's agenda. And, and I think that uh, we saw some of that in 2016. In my case, I saw a little bit more, particularly in the platform with, with Bernie Sanders. Uh, but I think that kind of uh, uh, continue uh, with more force in 2020. And, and, and we're going to continue to see uh, the, the effects of, of that. Of, of the migration of Puerto Ricans to the United States and how uh, they continue to play an important role in US politics. Thanks so much. Before going to Marisa, welcome. Um, I just wanted to say, because I may forget for later, that there was a remarkable ad that um, 
that was called uh, Hazlo Por Mi, Do It For Me, uh, which was uh, an ad, uh, t uh, Puerto Ricans from the island requesting from Puerto Ricans in the diaspora to vote in the 2020 U.S. elections in order for them to have access to the resources that they need since they cannot directly do so. And uh, in my own work, I had come across this uh, dream of some people in Puerto Rico that the diaspora would become more involved in the U.S. elections, but that ad pretty much materialized that uh, desire in a very uh, visceral way. You know, it was a direct appeal uh, from one community to the other, you know, in the imaginary of the ad. Um, so Marisa, uh, we um, we have talked about a whole lot of things, but the one missing piece would be to talk a bit more about the organizing dimensions of the 2020 elections. Um, we mentioned Mi Gente and we mentioned your work, so please. Hey everybody, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Marisa. I'm calling in from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I'm the director and co-founder of Mi Gente. And I wanted to just start with, I think for me, as I started, you know, the different waves of reflection on this election, um, you know, sometimes I think that there's like, you know, it's just, it's part of the game in politics that like, we, we have an argument about what the data means. Um, and so the way that played out this year was there was all this data coming out from place that, that was showing some level of shift towards Trump by Latinos. And he was like, no, 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 no. And it's like, no, we have to hold all of it. And to me, at the end of the day, I think what 2020 tells us is it 2020 is a snapshot. Nos guste o no of, um, it's a snapshot of the Latino community politically in the United States right now. And it is, and it is a snapshot of a people, a group of people who is coming into its own politically. That is messy, that is not clean, um, and it is wrought with opportunities, threats, and best practices, learnings that we can draw from if, if we want to, and indeed we must steer it in the right direction so that in fact, one of the fastest growing populations in this country is a force for good, is a force for transformation that is um, part of a multiracial, multinational force that tries to save this planet for our children. Um, and the reason I say that it's a snapshot and it's of a community coming in its own, just like on the off top, right? 2020 was a year that Latinos became the largest minority voting bloc. Um, we were the largest, we were the largest bloc. I would not say we we're the most powerful. And sometimes it's not just about numbers, but we became the largest. And that showed in several different races. But also, let Latinx people are the youngest demographically. I think the last time I saw it was age of 27. 27 is a very interesting age. <laughs> Those of you that have passed that time. So it's just like to me, like that, that to me felt like symbolically and very practically, like, yeah, 27 is when you're coming into your own, you're asking yourself, what am I gonna do? What have I done? Where am I gonna do? What, who am I going to be? And I think that's what we're asking ourselves. That is the present question. And so good, bad, or ugly, que nos guste o no, we have to talk about Florida as much as we have to talk about Arizona. But, um, but where I will push back is when the conversation became only about Florida and it only became about Texas because you cannot talk about the 2020 election and Biden winning and us turning Trump into a one-term president. Uh, without the efforts of folks in places like Arizona, without the efforts of people in Georgia, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin. And Latinx people are, are a very significant part of that. In some states, we provided a margin of victory, uh, like we expanded. We, we were actually the deciding force. And in other places, we expanded the margins of victory. Um, so our organization, you know, long has been focused on some of the places that you know, or, you know, years past where the flyover states because they were red states. Um, we've been very involved in the fight in Arizona following SB 1070. We were very involved in the fight in Georgia starting when Georgia got a SB 1070 copycat law. And so when I say SB 1070, it's it's the, the kind of known as the most anti-immigrant bill, uh, immigration bill passed the state level in Arizona almost 10 years ago that in many ways I think catalyzed, in fact, I think it did, catalyzed a movement um, in Arizona that I think you are seeing the fruits of in this last electoral cycle. Um, so 
you know, I, I, I think that on the organizing tip, there are some things I think we know that, that we're seeing. And, and our community is very, very diverse. Um, I think I think people are kind of getting the memo that you can't paint it, paint us all with one brush. At the same time, people are people and organizing is critical. And so I think some things that we saw, um, trust and authenticity is very, very important um, for us. That was that when we knock doors, people see us as as because we have strong lo local partnerships and relationships and because the people knocking on the door are from those communities, they understand we're going to be there after the election's over. No nomás estamos llegando para tocar la puerta y que voten y que ya, ya no hay nada. Um, I think you also saw that in, as a success, I would say, of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, the people they hired and the way they hired, people, you know, listening and hearing from folks in their own community was very, very important. So trust, I think, is a very significant piece of it. Early, going in early or just never stopping um, is, is critical. Um, you know, I think, again, to this, going back to this touch point of like a community coming into its own, a lot of our folks, you know, the, the origin, the stories were told as Latinx people um, is, you know, the kind of mythology of how you make it in the U.S. is, you know, put your head down, don't ask questions and work hard. Right. And so like how that relates to politics, what is our story of struggle? What is our story in the United States is one that I think is being reshaped right now. And, and being able to continue, we have to build our muscle memory. Um, I don't want to take too long, but like, I think one of the things I used to joke about is that every four years, there's this hand ringing. If the, let, let the sleeping giant will wake up, which I really hope that's retired after this cycle. Um, but yeah, we someone, retired it. We retired it already. Yeah, very good. Very good. I, I, I want to, I want to go to that retirement party. Um, you know, but it's like every four years, there's this hand ringing. It's like the Olympics, right? It's like the Olympics having in four years. And so it's almost like politically, it's like, are they going to win a gold medal when we haven't done a sit up in four years? Like we need to build a muscle memory of organizing and for people to see that organizing gets the goods. So that's why after elections, um, you know, someone, I think it was Maurice Mitchell from the Working Families Party said, you know, this is not a destination, it's a doorway. Now is when people's actually like, I voted, someone that never registered, never nada, they're voting and they're seeing, is Biden going to do something? Is my life going to qualitatively change? Like right now is actually when people are building the muscle memory. So those are some of the things that I think were really important, um, were really important like lessons and things that I think we've really focused on doing that I think paid off. The just last two things I'll say is like that I think we'll get into more is a media piece is very, very significant. Latinx people were some of the most um, impacted by disinformation campaigns. And I think it is a testament to the way our communities are marginalized in this country. Um, and why, like, I think the work that Julio does um, at Futuro Media and before that Latino Rebels is so important because our people don't have those kinds of outlets. Um, cultural organizing is critically important um, and platform. I think platform really mattered. And you saw that um, there's many examples of that in this in this cycle. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but excited to be here and have this conversation with y'all. Thanks so much. Um, so first, I, I was wondering if the panelists had a comment after listening to each other uh, for a round. Julio? I, yeah, I, I, this is kind of going back to the notion of the narratives and um you know in the story that i wrote this week for about the ucla report and i encourage a lot of people to look at because there's a lot of really um incredible um voter precinct data um when we talk about data and and, and embracing it like and i agree with with marisa um there's so many angles right there's so many stories and they're all equal okay but I did ask specifically about what um, what the professor mentioned about uh, the analysis of you know immigrant heavy districts that I think the New York Times did this you know flashy let's look at every immigrant heavy district in the United States oh people are you know and it's just it's going it's leaning towards the right and I think we do ourselves a little bit of a disservice because when I asked like the, the UCLA team is that. It's this false assumption already that every Latino is has the immigrant experience in the United States. And we are in every precinct right now in you know in the United States. We have different experiences. 
we have different ideologies, different points of view. And one of the biggest data points that really kind of almost confirms what Mi Gente did in, in Georgia is that in very low propensity Latino districts in Georgia, it was some of the highest support for Joe Biden in the state of Georgia. So you really like that, you know, I, I have an organ, I have someone who I know does the work in Georgia. And then I'm looking at data and saying that makes sense. You know, so, so these things of, of, you know, in the, the, the last thing I'll say is like, there's nothing that's historically different so far from the presidential preference preferences that it's still a third of Latino voters seem to vote Republican. Nothing's really hit the 40% watershed of George Bush. And why did George Bush do it? Because he invested in the community. So I do feel like there's a lot of attention being given to a third of the population when we're not talking about the 66 to 70% of all these other angles that are happening that is just fantastic work. I mean, when was the last time you saw anyone do a cover piece on the New York Times about organizers in Wisconsin? that on the same level as, you know, Cuban American voters in Miami. So that's where I think we need to push back because the data tells so many stories and I'm just not, um, I don't want to just say, Oh, everything moved back to the right. Cause I think it's a little bit more nuanced and complex as we, as you know, so. Seems like there was the expectation that, as I mentioned that because uh, it's a racialized population, that it should behave like other groups behave, or there's some. Uh, but I want to um, I want to ask about um, we've talked. I mean, what we've said so far suggests that there's multiple stories, uh, that there's enormous diversity. Uh, last in 2016, uh, Cristina Beltran was part of this uh, conversation, and she mentioned uh, Latino politics is always inherently coalitional politics. So that's another l layer. To it, but I'm curious if uh, you can talk a little bit. Um, any anybody that can talk about this, um, that if there were all these flips and if there was this expansion of participation, and if, if the bottom line is that the vast majority of Latinos uh, did not support Trump or or the right wing um, white supremacist agenda, um, what can you talk about specific strategies or specific um, ways of going about organizing and framing? that you found particularly um, effective? Or are we talking that because the diversity is such that there's a, a, a spectrum uh, that needs to be uh, produced uh, by location? I mean, that was something that Jamila and I had talked uh, yesterday about. Uh, because of the electoral college puts so much attention, sometimes not even on a state, but in a neighborhood or a, 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 dist a, a small district. Um, how do you go about organizing uh, such diverse, such diversity, and and within that kind of context of not a popular vote but an electoral college, which explains partly the obsession with Miami. Yeah. Um, so I wonder, Marisa or um, Julio or Jamil or Manuel, do you have any thoughts about um, this? And and in the Puerto Rico case, I think in the United States uh, there are a lot of people who would like to see a third party. That would that that it's a viable party or more parties, you know, get out to to the biparty system. Is there anything from your experience that you think would be uh, useful for organizers here in the United States? Well, I, I guess I'll jump in quickly. I, I I forgot to mention in my in my initial intervention that uh, when we organized Victoria Ciudadana uh, from the from the very first uh, general assembly that we had in which we decided our, our organizing structure for the El Movimiento, uh, we decided that the Puerto Rican diaspora had to be part of that organization. So, so we had a diaspora network uh, that participated in the decision-making process of every part of our movement. And, and I think that was important because there was a symbiotic relationship going on between that diaspora network and the things that were going on in Puerto Rico uh, and vice versa, whether it was best practices or things that were being done, uh, whatever state they were at, uh, the members of that diaspora network, uh, but also things that were happening in Puerto Rico that they were able to incorporate in the, in the initiatives that they were uh, implementing. I think from, from the conversations that we have had 
uh, with some of the members of, of our diaspora network uh, that have also participated in organizing in, in U.S. politics. A lot of it happened uh, in those uh, months and well, months mostly after Hurricane Maria, in which we had uh, thousands and thousands of Puerto Ricans uh, move, uh, whether it was to Florida, um, New York, uh, Chicago, uh, Connecticut, all over the U.S. really. And, and the initial support network um, was mostly of, around Latino organizations and how they use uh, those initial days of Puerto Ricans uh, that were expecting that once they landed in Fort Lauderdale or once they landed in Orlando, there was going to be this list of helps that the government help that was going to be available. And it was not necessarily the case. And how uh, Latino organized particularly used that uh, in order to engage Puerto Ricans that had just moved uh, to Orlando, whether it was uh, temporarily or eventually permanently, uh, to, to participate and to activate pol uh, politically, right? Uh, and, and we can talk about housing, we, talk, we can talk about education, we can talk about all the initial things that those families that moved to the U.S. needed. And in some cases, uh, they were successful in getting, in others not. But that became the next step uh, in terms of the organizing to say, well, that person that, that didn't help you when you got here has to be voted out of office. And the next chance we have, it's going to be this day, right? So I, I, I think that helped. And, and then in terms of the third-party politics, I, uh, I mean, there are third-party third party politics experiences in the United States uh, at the state level. And, and, and we can talk about, you know, different approaches to it, whether it's the working families uh, party uh, and other experiences that we use in Puerto Rico and, and that we're uh, consistently monitoring, monitoring to see how we can we can uh, incorporate that, I, I I I say this. I that's why I ran for mayor of San Juan. I think it was important that a third party uh, establish its presence at the municipal level, so we can have something to show for uh, for the rest of the island in this case. And and that's the way I would go about uh, third party third party organizing in U.S. I I would start at the community level, at the municipality level, at the state level, and then build from there uh, in order to, to one day have, have the opportunity of a third party that's a viable candidate uh, for the presidency of the United States. Thank you so much, Manuel. Um, any, any, I mean, there's some burning question here on the Q&A that I wanna bring. Um, so uh, Elizabeth Mendes Berry, uh, how are you? Um, so, so uh, Elizabeth and, and other people here on the Q&A are curious about what to do with uh, this information, right? Um, what would be some strategies? And, and being in Florida, uh, very much I have seen that on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that people are tuning in to uh, radio uh, shows, uh, you know, and there's very, other, very limited other options that they turn to for information. Um, making viable that people that ordinarily would not uh, support Trump uh, would, uh, you know, would have or did. Um, so uh, question is, you know, what are some strategies to deal with media, uh, both at the level of, uh, Yamil, what you call the ecosystems, the Latino ecosystems like um, conservative radio in Miami and elsewhere in the country, uh, but also uh, more generally? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the reason why I refer to um uh you know this uh kind of world of of information uh that that kind of uh you know surrounds latinos as as ecosystems is because i think uh you know at least traditionally political science is really focused on uh the major kind of media conglomerates you know like univision telemundo but uh i think you know in recent years there's been certainly more attention to the very the varying ways in which uh people are receiving political information which is you know, beyond, uh, you know, podcasts like uh, Julio's work, uh, you know, there, there are blogs, but also uh, social media as, and, and it's kind of growing influence within uh, the Latino community. And I think, uh, you know, uh, studying these ecosystems is important in the sense that we have to not only think about 
you know, uh, major kind of, uh, you know, traditional media sources, right? Thinking about a Nuevo Herald in, in Miami or Radio Mambi, uh, but also how that also links up with, uh, you know, these kind of disinformation campaigns, like what we saw during the 2020 election, where you had WhatsApp groups that there was, there was you know, blatant falsehoods that were being spread, uh, you know, widely. Um, one of the challenges with this kind of, this form of disinformation um, is that it's really difficult to track. You have private encrypted platforms that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in contrast to, let's say, Facebook and Twitter, where you might include some disclaimer that uh, there's some false news being shared, this can be shared pretty much freely. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the challenges with dealing with this information, at least uh, as, as it relates to these, uh, these uh, you know, WhatsApp groups, for instance, that, that were highlighted in the 2020 election, is that you, to some extent, you need to kind of bulk up the traditional kind of uh, uh, media environment to some to some extent. You need to invest more in fact checking, for instance. Uh, you know, it, 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 and there was some effort on the part of uh, Spanish language outlets uh, like Telemundo and Univision to uh, invest more money in in fact checking uh, outlets. There was also uh, there was pairing uh, pair. Uh, 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 efforts uh, between uh, uh, fact-checking communities, so the International uh, Fact-Checking Network and uh, the Spanish language networks to basically create a, a WhatsApp bot that tried to, you know, kind of combat some of the, this uh, disinformation that was being shared on the platform. I think, though, that this is a really challenging issue, again, given that you're dealing with private conversations. Um, it's something that, uh, you know, at, at least for voters who don't have a kind of strong connection to American politics, uh, and uh, it, it, especially those who don't really have the, the best sense, let's say, of the two-party system, then receiving really extreme information about a particular candidate, I think, can have a pretty dramatic uh, effect. Um, and so, you know, this is something I'm, I'm certainly worried about, but I also don't want to, like, act as if uh, this disinformation is something that's uh, not coordinated and doesn't fit into the broader media ecosystem. Again, Radio Mambi and, and you have other kind of media outlets in Miami that were, for the most part, ma making very similar arguments that, that, that you might see in these WhatsApp chains. Um, so uh, I think it's a complicated problem, but I, I am glad to see that uh, traditional Spanish language media outlets are, are really trying to bulk up and, and provide a counterpunch to uh, some of what we're seeing. It's about time for sp traditional Spanish language media outlets to wake up to this. And and I think, you know, again, one of the reasons, and I agree with you, I mean, it's part of the culture, right? It's part of the information culture. When you come, when we really, to be honest with you, have lived in sort of this left-right world coming from Latin American countries where we're used to sensationalism um, and not for anything, but Univision and Telemundo have been at fault in a lot of ways for allowing this sort of like thirst for, uh, you know, sensationalism and and drama and and you know, cartel murders. You know what I mean? Like this type of of and that's you know that's on us as a community. And I I understand sort of the intent because it's kind of. But we've, it, it, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's such a de deep developed program that you're, you're, you're just chipping away at like, you know, it's, it's like your whole, like so, there's a flood and you're literally putting your finger against the wall and the, the, you're just being inundated in water. So I do think that we also, and this is where I kind of like to plug, and I thank you, uh, I mean, for, for saying that I like what you do. And so does Marisa. It's like, we need more independent voices to play in this cultural space to question um to be challenging politics um you know i have the former you know manuel uh you know i'm a puerto rican journalist that covers puerto rico and not a not a week goes by where you know i'm being accused of working for the venezuelan government i mean i've actually have people tweets about that because i have a star uh, as Latino rebels, and people believe this. And when you have truth seekers out there, we need to elevate the role of those truth seekers, whether it's massive fact checking, whether it's, you know, putting the voices out there, because I do think that that's part of the problem. And we're in a set, you know, and not to, I feel like, you know, people are going to take my clips out of context and think I'm 
I'm like massively criticizing Miami, but that is the media market of the Spanish language, you know, the Latino community. I mean, it, that's what it's become. And, and, and if we don't challenge that, it's not going to go away. And so I, I really believe that we, we invest more locally. We look at different voices. We focus on stories that are happening in places where we don't expect things to happen. And we question it all. And, um, you know, I've been, I was on way too many WhatsApp groups in Florida because my family's in Orlando that I would have to tell, like, you know, my stepmom's older friend that, no, Hugo Chavez is not coming back. He's not going to be secretary of transportation. Um, but that's where the, th you know, things like that. So I do think it's a problem. Um, but also like people like Marisa who, who, who do it with authenticity and love. I, I think we just have to elevate and amplify the people that are doing it right in a lot of ways. Um, Marisa, do you want to comment? I mean, there's another um, um, question here that has to do with uh, another version of what I asked earlier, which is, um, is, it, uh, is it necessary to compartmentalize strategies to reach individual Latino communities and their particular needs? Are strategies to reach the Latinx community as a whole useless, or is there a common ground that can be established? And I think that's another version of what I was asking earlier. I think it's a, it's a burning question. It's a both end. Um, I think there's some aspects that like, you know, in my, in my organizing career, I've organized in public housing projects in, you know, in, in, in Northern California, I've done domestic worker, organized domestic workers in New York City, I've done barrios in Phoenix. Like there are some things that it's just how you, how you connect with people around a, a, something happening in their community or political issue and try to bring them into formation to take collective action to resolve their problems. That's organizing. And some of that, it doesn't matter if you're Nicaragüense, Cubano, it's, you know, it doesn't matter. So some of that, no, it's just that no one bothers most of the time. Our community is an afterthought. And that's the problem that we don't have the infrastructure we need. We don't have the people, you know, and, and all of this is connected to the lack of organization, because when you have organization, you have an ability to develop people so that people can find other people and it and and if you have that relationship to the community you are developing a platform that's relevant um so that is across the board now where i think we must be um more compartmentalized if you will or i i kind of look at it as pluralism is the cultural piece is the piece that like the message you use on tejanos in south texas is very different than you will use with Dominicans living outside of Boston, right? Because, um, because of the role that immigration plays. Um, people's politics in their home countries, their experiences like greatly impacts, but also it's just the culture of a thing. You don't play Chente, <laughs> you don't go play Chente, Vicente Fernandez in, in Little Havana. I mean, you could, because sometimes people like Mexican mariachi music, but still, you just don't want to do it. <laughs> so that's, I think, where there's nuance and there's particularity. And that's why it's important to have people that are actually directly impacted, directly related to these issues and these places, um, being able to weigh in and tell you, no, 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 that's not the look. So it's a both end, in my opinion. Um, and with respect to the disinformation, it's, a, it's, it's actually, it's a very specific problem and a, a pressing, burning problem in our community, but it's actually everywhere i think it's a it's a everybody problem um so i don't know that there's a the right you know like silver bullet but um there's i think it's like it's i don't think facts are gonna win i think stories win and so it's about what are the stories and who are the storytellers and particularly the question of storytellers is a big big part of it because once people go down the rabbit hole Um, it's only people that they know and trust that will pull them out if anybody can. And they're kind of getting to that place with some of the Trump folks. Um, so I just wanted to say then politically, um, you know, outside of that, I'm just going to say it. We have to beat, we have to beat, we have to beat our opponents sometimes. I don't mean physically, but we have to win and we have to make those victories count. Um, and so right now what we do with this win, so people are like, you're going to enact socialism. And it's like, no, actually just explain expanded access to healthcare. You have healthcare, right? Cool. Is that good? Great. Like, no, no, el mundo no se está acabando. 
Um, and that's the other piece I think that we have to do. Uh, there's another um, question that I think is important that we haven't, uh, I mean, we haven't mentioned really, uh, which has to do with churches and religion. Uh, and the question is, um, what was the role of religion and church in Latinx voting in uh, in this 2020 election? Now, um, now, Manuel mentioned there was a, a conservative party in Puerto Rico, a new one that's uh, religious. Um, but uh, more broadly uh, across the spectrum, what was the role of, of, of religion and churches in this 2020 election? Julio. I I was just going to say the role of mega churches and evangelicals in the community, I think if um, played a key part in, at least in Trump's efforts. So even if you look at um, one of the things we did back in the day uh, when the Latinos for Trump um, committee or whatever actually became an official part of the Trump campaign this time around, we looked at everyone's bio. Right, who was on it? You know, you did have the the head of the fiscal control board at the time. Uh, Carrion uh, was part of it, uh, but there were a lot of there were two or three leaders of mega churches in Nevada, in Texas, and I believe in Florida, where the role of Latino evangelicals. I again, not to sound like the broken record when it comes to media representation. But when you think about, you know, the Christian American evangelical, the last person you're going to think about is some, you know, some pastor on the El Paso Juarez border who who has, you know, 4,000 people showing up at a mega church, And they were influential. And I think the role of um, evangelicals in, in the sort of the American Christian tradition of politics, we're going to see more and more of that um, as they become queen and kingmakers. Um, but I thought it was very effective. Uh, it was very smart of the Trump campaign to do it because it plays into the ideological part of what I think the Republican Party has become. Um, you know, they can deal with someone who, in the end, um, we know incited white supremacists to attack a capital because he's pro-life. And, uh, you know, he's he's for values. So a lot of the things that you know, when people talk about Reagan and his famous quote about, you know, Latinos are, are Republicans, they don't even know it because of their faith background. Um, that shouldn't be underestimated. And I do think, to be honest with you, on my last point on this, Biden's Catholicism, um, I think also played a role for him. I think people saw him as someone who was a man of faith, who who knows he goes to church and, you know, Un buen católico. Um, that might have spurned, you know, maybe some older voters who maybe might have feared socialism. Um, but I do think that that's one of the more under, that's one of those angles that we're going to see more is this role of these mega churches being more involved in, in, in political like lobbying and advocacy. And, and it's a platform. I, I, I mean, other than the specific, it's, a, it's another platform to uh, provide information, whether it's uh, real information or not. And, and we saw it in Puerto Rico, uh, particularly with this uh, right wing uh, conservative uh, party that, that was also created in 2019 that was able to elect uh, one member of Puerto Rico's House of Representatives, one member of Puerto Rico's uh, Senate. Uh, that, you know, they had island-wide results. And, you know, every Sunday or every Saturday when you have your pastor saying the same things that you are hearing in all these other sensational media outlets, uh, it's not the same when you hear it from a puppet doll uh, that talks about chismes than when you hear it from your pastor, who's the person that you believe, Right. And, and when you're walking around that community on a Monday afternoon and they tell you, oh, yeah, I heard about you guys. My pastor told me about you. And, and you know, that was going to be a tough conversation to have because uh, usually they were not going to say nice things of, about us. Right. And, and I think it goes uh, in terms of, of platform and audience. And then also it goes to the, to the previous question about this information. I out of necessity, in our case, particularly. Uh, we had to build our own 
outlets to communicate directly with people without the intermediaries. That was our only hope of getting our message out there uh, because on the on the lucky, lucky chance that we were be invited to one of the main uh, TV shows in Puerto Rico or, or that we were given access to the written uh, to the biggest newspaper here in Puerto Rico, you knew that whatever you were going to say, it was going to be editor editorialized uh, to in the benefit of the two-party system that at the end of the day are the ones that pay for the ads at those uh, newspapers. So either you just try to play the game and, and try to get in, and we decided not to do that. And we said, you know what? We need to uh, know our audience we need to know who we are trying to get our message to. And with the limited resources that we have, we need to talk directly to those individuals. And, and to, to, to give you a, a specific example, uh, I was not invited to the main political TV analysis shows in Puerto Rico. I was not invited uh, to the main radio shows. Uh, the biggest newspaper in Puerto Rico said that uh, in, a, in a poll that I will get 10% or 12% of the vote. And, and I said, you know what, I, I, I'm going to fight all of that, trying to speak directly to the people that I know I can move towards uh, voting for our movement. So, so I think with, with the church situation, it's another platform that unfortunately uh, you're going to have to deal with. Uh, and it's one that has the confidence of the people. Because like I mentioned before, cuando tu pastor, cuando tu reverendo is the one that's saying it to you, it's quite differently than when you read it on the news or you have the uh, suit and tie guy that's giving you the political analysis. And, and that gives you a whole nother level of, 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 of politics that, that you have to uh, make sure that you address or, or else every Sunday, uh, you, you're going to have a crowd that's uh, more convinced that you are the worst thing that could happen to this community or, or to this island. Um, okay, so I think we are at the edge of our time. So I just, uh, uh, there's another question, I guess, another variation of the strategy question. Uh, but I think these questions are all about, uh, Marisa, you mentioned the muscle, right? How to keep exercising the muscle from here to 2024, and also that I make it clear that electoral politics is not all that politics is. Uh, community engagement, you know, like there, there's the, obviously uh, power is high, heavily concentrated in the state. However, power is made every day in communities when they organize. Um, so uh, this question has to do with how to uh, increase participation of Latinos in school boards, city councils. Uh, also going back to Manuel's uh, suggestion of starting from the municipality. Uh, particularly in red areas like uh, rural Iowa or Minnesota. So I think this uh, maybe as a, as a last round, uh, how is it that people can become more engaged? How is it that people can participate? And that's actually not that easy, you know, sometimes. Sometimes you, you show up and say, I want to participate and, you know, nobody knows what to do with you. Uh, so what are strategies about that, that people can uh, use to become more engaged? Um, um, in this process, both at the local, uh, very grassroots, municipal, and, and, and all other layers. How can we get people uh, active? Um, so I think it's true, and it can be hard. Um, I think that's part of our problem is that we, we have one of the fastest growing uh, populations in this country and we do not have, and we're, and, and it's very, I hope by now it's very clear that that growth is going to be met with some level of resistance and hatred and bigotry um, as is the history of, you know, very much part of the history of this country. Um, and we don't have an infrastructure at the local level and, and for sure and definitely at the national level as well. Um, that's why we started Mi Gente. Obviously, one organization isn't the whole solution. But what I would say is that um, I think in the most sort of broad way is join something. Um, join anything you can, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, a local kind of community organization, whether you're, you're part of like, you know, a person of faith, um, 
you know, now with like the sort of digital platforms that exist, there's a lot of ways to get involved. So I think joining something, if you're not, if that's not your steez, like one thing I used to say a lot is like, get people together. Um, obviously that's a little complicated in the current context, but you know, all of us, you know, most of us either like to, you know, like a party or like a social event, invite people over your house, have a dinner party, have a conversation. Like, um, you know, how many of your family members are registered to vote? Um, certainly most of us, you know, whether it's kids' birthday parties or some kind of party, we know how to do that. And so that's the thing sometimes that organizing has kind of made this like very difficult thing that, you know, no one can do except for only certain people. And I think we need to like, you know, understand that that's not always the case. Um, but um, I think that's the most basic level. And I do think that probably some of the electoral pieces are some of the ways that are most accessible for people to get involved in is a really good entry point. Um, you know, we've been able to support folks at the local level running for office. Um, and they also have a very particular experience once they win. Um, and so I think it's, you know, how are we building, a, you know, an ecosystem? That's ultimately what we need. Um, and, and, but I think the basic thing is, is either join something or like just start something, right. having people even just engage in a conversation about politics and what, what do they think, how do they understand what's happening in the world? And I also wanted to say that after, I remember after the Hurricane Maria, there were so many invitations for people trying to understand what's happening. And one of the experiences I had is that people sometimes felt, over, felt overwhelmed by the complexity of, of everything that, that they thought was off or wrong. And that could be overwhelming. And I guess what I would say to that is pick what you're more passionate about, what bugs you the most, what you really cannot stand for one more second that it is in that current shape and tackle that. That could be uh, at the level of school. That could be pick up of trash. That could be small to huge, but uh, it's a starting point uh, that then will uh, enable you to connect with other people with similar concerns and continue to build that infrastructure and that network necessary uh, to mobilize uh, continuously to pressure for change and transformation. So um, as a last uh, round, any final thoughts from our panelists? I think the issue that we, you know, I love what Marisa says because the messiness of it all and and the way it started and what is real political power and we're just starting to figure it out. And I love this image of a 27 year old just kind of wait, whoa, I'm 27, I'm three years from 30. What am I gonna do with my life? And I do feel like that is perhaps the most perfect analogy of where we are. But I am left with two two really key takeaways that I, as a journalist, am going to continue. And one of them was with my interview with Matt Barreto of, of UCLA LPPI, who says, it's time to put the term Latino vote, not only sleeping giant, it's time to put the term Latino vote on the shelf as well and just say Latino voters, you know, look at voters as people. Um, you know, we don't do the same when it comes to, you know, no one says white voters, they're not a, they're not a monolith. You know, and I think that's a challenge for all of us to get to that, where we can get rid of labels like monolith and sleeping giant and the Latino vote out of the lexicon. And number two, because of our complexity, because of the baggage that we bring, especially in a time where we're, we're looking for, you know, we're seeking racial and social justice, the inward look in our community to 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 make sure that we're representative of, of who we are and we begin to have those, those questions about race and privilege and the baggage that we bring each, you know, every one of us from Latin America and, and kind of question it all. And I think those are the two things that will continue to drive it. And we own this narrative. So I, I'm really appreciative that we can talk amongst here collegially because no one's going to figure it out for us. We're going to figure it out ourselves. And I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Marisa Franco said. We're just at the beginning. And, and um, it's nice to be 27. <laughs> Here's a hope. Uh, any other thoughts uh, to Manuel? Yes, I, I, I think there's uh, a generational component to this, right? El, el, el cambio generacional. And, and, and I think uh, for for 
if I would say how, how we come about change, I, I think we bet on the future and, and we bet off on education and we bet on our youth and we bet off on, on our children and, and make sure we, we invest on, on those individuals that, that are going to be uh, the gateway to their parents, to their grandparents. And, and, and I think that change is already happening, right? And I mean, I'm, I'm going to be 35 in a couple of, of, of months. Uh, I was elected at 27. Uh, uh, I came from the student movement at the University of Puerto Rico. And, and for me, it was always a long game. I, I knew that what I wanted to do in Puerto Rican politics was not going to be possible day one, day two, in the next uh, cuatrenio. And, and that I needed to, to be part of, of that generational change. So when my fellow members of the House of Representatives were meeting with their, uh, you know, with their, uh, their fundraisers and whatnot, I was going to elementary schools and intermediate schools, public and private all over Puerto Rico. And when I get back, they would say, where were you? And I was like, oh, yeah, I was talking with fifth graders. And they said, why would you do that? Uh, they don't vote. I'm like, well, they have a clear, uh, una, una idea más clara del Puerto Rico que queremos, que probablemente lo que tú tienes. And, and, and for me, seven years after that, I, I saw some of those kids that I met at their sixth or fifth grade going for the first time to the ballots and saying not only that they voted for change, but hey, I was able to convince my mom. I was able to convince my grandmother. Um, so, so I think uh, we need to start early and we need to make sure that, that we invest in, in our youth uh, because they're, they're going to take it all the way. And, and we're probably not going to see all the changes that, that we've been fighting for. Uh, but if we clear the path for those that are coming after us, uh, that's our, our, our nuestra responsabilidad generacional. And I have a 10-year-old here looking at me saying, like, yes, uh, that's exactly what we need to do. And, and I'm, uh, I, I say this in Puerto Rico, and I'm sure you feel the same way in your community. Um, Puerto Rico tiene más futuro que pasado. And, and we cannot be in better hands of, from that generation that's, you know, paving the way. And, and, and I'm very, very excited of, of what's next. Well, on that note, which is uh, much more viable than going back to be 27 uh, thank you, everybody, uh, Julio, Manuel, Yamil, Marisa, um, Adina, and uh, Dennis for this opportunity. And um, everybody that um, was here and wants the other people to um, participate or at least listen to what we did, uh, you can also go to the link and see the recording, uh, uh, listen to the recording where it's available. Thanks again. And uh, we will be uh, continuing to exercise our muscles uh, when we get off.